every generation adds something to the complications of mankind. We started out comparatively innocent creatures. We had our moments of difficulty, but we went along pretty well probably for the first 50 or 75 million years. And since that, it's been gradually getting worse. One of the reasons it's worse, of course, is there are more of us. The second thing is, each generation has bestowed upon the future the priceless heritage of its own uncorrected mistakes. We keep right on doing the thing wrong, and the more of us to do wrong, more opportunities to do wrong, more things to get that we can't afford, more tension and stress to disturb our internal lives, and little by little, a creature that was fashioned for rather natural ways of life has reached the present impasse. We are now facing and paying, in a sense, for the mistakes of the ages. Actually, of course, this sounds rather uh, formidable and a bit dishonest. Why should a hap hap hapless generation like ours be expected to pay for the past? Well, of course, philosophy has various attitudes on that, all the way from atheism, who says there's no reason, and that it's just bad luck, which will be corrected by doing something worse. <laughs> now, the uh, general approach, however, from a philosophical standpoint, certainly in the Orient, is that we are the same people that did it before. That this condition that we have now is not falling on innocent heads. It is falling on those who all down through a whole cycle of embodiments have continuously made the same mistakes. In other words, we are paying for our own pasts and not for somebody else's. Now, when we start out with a problem, it very often looks quite simple. We feel that we can get away with a little of this, or no one will notice this or that, but actually nothing passes unnoticed. And in the world we live in, the conduct of the individual becomes the basis of the future existence of the race. We must sometime come to this realization. In the meantime, we must face the present emergencies which summarize our own basic activity. Today we are in very complicated conditions. We are in a condition of fear, anxiety, uh, pressure. We have many different causes for negative thinking. We realize that we are not happy, that the prospects of becoming happy are growing less likely all the time, and that we are here in the midst of an anxiety which is closing in upon nearly everyone. This anxiety is not only concerned with the life of the individual himself, but with his associates, his nation, and his world. We are becoming very fearful, very uncertain, rather pessimistic about the future of the world in which we live. Now, what seems to be the answer to this? Well, there are all kinds of answers that people have advanced, all the way from some kind of arbitration to open uh, action and uh, activism. But no one thinking any of these processes through carefully can consider them actually remedial. No matter what we do, we are still faced with an emergency that affects all of us. And this emergency is probably going to remain, at least in part, for the rest of our natural life expectancies. So what do we do? When we can't change the world, we must recognize that it is basically an educational institution. For a long time we have believed that we live in a world which is primarily for the purpose of amusing us. It's a war world in which we can enjoy things, whether we can afford them or not. A world in which we can go in debt. We can afford wars. We can continue to allow inequities and uh, absurdities 
to very largely dominate our conditions. So we have to recognize that one of the reasons we are having so many anxieties is because we're not worrying about the right things. Now it's quite possible that when we worry about the right things we will be still very worried. But that type of worry, the better type, may impel some change in action, some modification of processes and policies that are responsible for our present state. We are looking around now with a little apprehension and uh, remembering faintly at least the great hope and achievement of the uh, Olympic Games. In simple words, we are all going for the gold. That seems to be the most important thing at the moment. And we are gradually changing the world into a vast amphitheater or coliseum which is composed of almost completely of competing people. Everyone wants to outdo somebody in something. But the things they want to have this achievement in are not the things that are necessary. We are concerned now not with outstripping our associates in their com competitions, but rather finding ways to bring together in a sensible, useful manner uh, the resources of the, com of the country and the world. Now there are many debates on the problem of resources. One side, the optimists say they'll always last. The other side says they're almost gone. This type of thinking again adds, adds to our anxiety, but brings very little useful solution to us. What we must try to do, if it is possible, is to build within ourselves a kind of security which cannot be completely dominated by world conditions. In other words, as far as it is within our power, we should live as we know we ought to live in a world that is not headed in that direction. We must recognize that integrity is the only basic security that we have. And the moment we violate it, we get into trouble. Now, people will tell you that their security concepts have also gotten them into trouble. That the individual has tried to live the golden rule and has ended in bankruptcy. That it is impossible to live the principles that we believe in a world that has very little constructive psychology functioning in it at this time. But I think we still have to recognize that the individual is a unit. This individual unit, according to uh, esoteric philosophies, has been an individual for millions and millions of years. It has its destiny in its own keeping. It comes and goes, appears and disappears, but keeps on going through uncounted ages and countless incarnations. The individual, therefore, is a being that must ultimately take control of its own life, its own purposes, its own integrities, must live as it should regardless of consequences, and live as harmlessly as possible, always looking for new ways of cooperating rather than new ways for excelling our neighbors. If we are individuals, if we have our own destiny and our own keeping, and it seems that we must, because we observe occasionally an individual who takes control of his own destiny and does something about it. And these are the heroes and unforgettable characters of the human race. Now, in the anxiety patterns as we have them today, we have to settle down to, to consider the cause of the anxiety in ourselves. Most people, I think, will admit that the main cause of anxiety at the moment is insecurity. It is the inability of the individual to have the things that he wants to have or believes he is entitled to. It is also true that his wants today are far greater than ever before, and there are more and more people with more and more wants. And this further complicates our entire pattern of civilized relationships. Most people claim 
most thoughtful people claim to have some concept of religion. They may, agree, may not agree in creedal uh, particulars, but they do have a sense of awareness that there is a power beyond themselves that must govern the destinies of existence. Whatever it is and wherever it is, it represents a supreme purpose. Whatever created this condition in, un in the universe, or created the universe for this condition to arise in, has a purpose. There is a reason for existence. If the individual is able uh, to bring his inner resources together and begin to contemplate this reason, it may help him to recognize that the infirmities and anxieties that affect him are, in a sense, unreasonable. We know, for instance, that people are convinced, many millions of them, that deity knew what it was doing when it fashioned this plan. And somewhere there is a supreme power that is just, reasonable, intelligent, and useful. That this power has ordained a creation and created it, and has gradually guided its destiny through millions of years. The individual, most people, of the two and a half billion whom we know to be committed to some type of religion, we know that these people affirm that deity knew what it was doing. And most of them will be willing to admit that we do not know what we are doing. Now this interval has to be crossed in some practical way. For the average religionist, one of the keys to this problem is faith. We may not know all the answers to everything, but if we have faith in the ultimate victory of good over evil, truth over error, life over death, we realize there is a purpose, and that in some way our own peace of mind and peace of heart depends upon agreeing with and advancing this purpose. If we go against it, our anxieties increase. Nearly all of the anxieties that we know today are based upon the selfishness and arrogance and unthoughtfulness of our fellow human beings. We know that this is a mistake and a danger, but we also have the opinion that uh, we should be allowed to do as we please, regardless of consequences. The moment we are invited to economize, we will vote that officer out of office. We all know that everyone but ourselves should be better. We all know that everyone except ourselves should be good-natured. That we also, all but ourselves, have, have no right to their actions, many of them, but that we always have a right to ours. Now, this forms a rather technical tangle, and there is no immediate answer to just how to untangle this situation, except by gradually coming to the realization that selfishness on any level is contrary to the good and survival of a civilization. Now, selfishness at the top creates a vast system of wealth. Uh, selfishness at the base or at the bottom uh, creates a vast system of discontent. This discontent largely is a result of looking up and seeing the wealth. This combination is too much for us. It always has been. I think in, uh, years and years ago, a long time ago, the Japanese had a very interesting answer to this. They were a country that for 250 years prior to the arrival of Piri uh, managed to live together without a war or without fighting anybody else. Now the secret of this was the strategy of the Tokugawa shogunate. The great center of wealth in Japan at that time was the city of Osaka, which was where the merchants, the traders, the bankers 
the speculators, the stockbrokers, had their headquarters. Now they kind of felt themselves to be sort of special people. They had wealth and lots of it. And every turn time they turned around, they added a few more million yen to their treasuries. And Yasuo Tokugawa, looking at this for a little while, observed what he considered to be a serious mistake. The men were in, down in Osaka were dressing in the most expensive materials possible. Their homes were the most gorgeous possible. They were putting everything into a great show. And they were always followed by at least two retainers with two swords for no particular purpose because there was no war at that time. But it was part of the great gl glory of the moment. The ladies of the family were dressed in the most elaborate silks and satins that money could buy. The Japanese didn't have any jewelry such as we have. Most of their jewelry was made of bamboo, so that wasn't much of a factor. But they had their hair done most magnificently, and their faces powdered white until they looked like walking Carrara marble. And they really made quite a show of all this. So Iyasu in Edo, now Tokyo, looked it over and he said, this isn't so good. Here we have in this I, these islands many millions of people who do not live in Osaka and are not in this type. They are farmers, agriculturists, small business people, and things of this nature. We cannot and must not allow a display of wealth on one hand to f cause us to forget that all of this wealth is utterly, ultimately in rice. And the rice farmers are the ones who make all our money for us. Then we do other things with it. So Tokugawa said to his officers, and they always did what he told them, because if they didn't, they weren't there long. He said, go down there and tell them to take off all this glory. Move into simple homes. Get rid of all these ostentations of wealth. No more publicity about how much they make or how much they have. Tell them to live like ordinary people so that they will not cause amb ambitions that cannot be fulfilled to rise in the hearts and minds of our subjects. So, in a few days it all disappeared down in Osaka. Because if it didn't disappear, the culprit disappeared and was not seen again. Now comes the trick. And that is that the desire for this ostentation didn't die. The bankers and the, all the wealthy people were dressed in sober black. They walked very sedately. Uh, they uh, made no show of wealth. But on, on the lining of every garment was filled with gold thread. <laughs> they had the most uh, expensive things, but they didn't show. This went on for a while, but after a while, I think Tokugawa saw one of them, and more restrictions were placed. But the whole thing sums up in the fact that when some have too much and others have too little, social disruption is inevitable. And this was something they found out in the early years of the 17th century. Now, we have the same problem here today. Part of our discontent is not that we do not have what we need, but that we do not have all that we want. And it, I believe, was Socrates who observed on one occasion that there are two ways of becoming wealthy. One is by having more, and the other is by needing less. And the survival of our civilization is going to depend upon the gradual emergence of a moderate attitude toward wealth. We are going to have to get to the point where we no longer are envious of everyone who has more than we do. And it isn't now so difficult to get over this envy when we realize the miserable condition of the wealthy. They are more miserable than we are. But as one person said rather uh, uh, meaningfully, if we must be miserable, it is perhaps more pleasant to suffer from the miseries of wealth. <laughs> But it's not necessarily so. These young people on heroin and other narcotics, the uh, infidelities, uh, the extravagances, uh, seemingly have very little reward. And in the long run, and not always a long run, 
these extravagant people dig their own graves. It's not uh, so much, therefore, of of an advantage to seemingly have more than we need. Now the question is, what do we need? And in this, I think it's very interesting to go back to the utopians of the 16th and 17th century, beginning with Moore's Utopia, Campanella's City of the Sun, Andre's Christianopolis, and Bacon's New Atlantis. These were the 17th century uh, uh, utopias. In the 18th century, the temper changed. Humanism was rising, and the utopia was no longer a going institution in some remote place. It was now a desert which the individual had to cultivate for himself. But in the 17th century utopians, there was very great emphasis upon basic integrities. And these imaginary but very plausible communities, mostly strongly Lutheran by persuasion, uh, actually set up patterns that could have and did have for a long time considerable influence in modern thinking and helped to lead to what we might term the universal reformation of knowledge. These utopians are all socialized commonwealths. They were uh, institutions in which all equalities were bestowed upon possessions. The individual could not gain power through wealth. On the other hand, there was every inducement for the individual to improve, grow, and become famous, useful, important, and remembered because of the development of his internal life. In other words, the one place where there was no competition was in the rapidity with which the individual can improve himself. This is not competitive. And to do this, a certain common generosity, a certain universal integrity had to be the governing factor. Most of these utopias, in fact all of them, were religiously dominated. But in their religious domination, they took the socializing aspect of Christianity and applied it to the physical problems of living. In other words, they were building a commonwealth or a world uh, that was based upon the integrities of basic Christianity as it was taught by Jesus, but not necessarily exemplified by the church. It was the basic human factor. If you love God, love one another. This dominated the utopians. Now, some of this utopian world would seem very stuffy today, and it was even then. But at the same time, it inspired the individual to realize that the greatest contribution that he could make to the continuance of civilization was to become civilized himself in his own lifetime. That by doing this, he was laying the foundation for the future. Every family that raised children in the utopian community was actually expanding the utopia. Comenius in his educational system, which was part of the utopian scheme, was convinced that in order to progress civilization, every child's moral code, ethical code, spiritual conviction, and dedication had to be bestowed upon him before he entered the public school. In other words, his inner life was governed by his family. If the family was wrong, he was wrong. If he resisted the family, it was a mistake. On the other hand, if the family neglected him, in any way shortchanged his needs, became selfish as mature persons, and paid less attention to the young, or were mentally or emotionally unequipped to teach the young properly. Any case of this kind would spread out and in the course of a thousand years would disastrously affect thousands of new generations. It had to start in what what, uh, Comenius called the mother school. Here was taught the gentle virtues, the kindly attitudes, the honesties and integrities of life, These were imparted before the child learned to read or write. 
They were the, the cultural heritage to which every young person coming into this world is entitled. Lacking in this, they can try in schools and in universities to make up this loss if it is not uh, applicable to the home life. But if it's too late, the twig is bent and the tree will be inclined from then on. So if you want an honest world, start by dedicating efforts to the m making of honest young people. Doing so by instructing them yourself, if you are in the, have a family. And also, in the instruction of them, remember as Comenius said, no amount of instruction is valuable unless it is supported by the evidence of uh, personal action. In other words, the individual must teach by living better himself. The child will not be influenced constructively by being told to be good by parents who are making no effort to improve their own characters or natures. So as it all works out, we have gradually inherited this mess, largely because people have come to the conclusion that they were here to advance their own destinies. They were here to accumulate, dominate. They were here to become leaders of nations. They have, are here to fulfill all kinds of personal ambitions. And in our generation, most of these ambitions have strong financial overtones. So living in this world is not easy. And most people didn't get the kind of start they should have had. <clears throat> but if they didn't, then if possible, they should recognize the importance of a universal reformation of themselves. They should realize that it is their privilege and power to pick up and improve the standards of their living the moment they realize that this is necessary. If they don't know that it is necessary, adversity has not yet had its perfect work in them. But the moment we know that we should do certain things, that there are purposes in life that are neglected for lesser purposes, though and as soon as we know this, we must try to take charge of our own problems. Now, <clears throat> we have all of us, and most professional counselors and clergymen, are constantly deluged by people who are suffering from the tensions of adversity. Uh, they regard themselves as abused, neglected. They consider their lives ruined by incidents that have occurred perhaps 50 years earlier. They live in un under a tremendous cloud which gradually closes in as a great pessimism, a sense of futility, which may in turn be backed finally by a belligerence in which they turn desperately upon the environment which they feel have injured them. This is the way it goes in this world, but there has to be something done about it. And the only way it can be done is that the individual, either through pain or through wisdom, must find his own place in a proper state of consciousness. Now, actually, we know, from every psychiatrist knows, that these negative attitudes, these constant feelings of being abused or neglected, or that others are having opportunities that do not come to us, or that we are not appreciated for the merits which we possess. All these thoughts constantly have a strong effect upon the physical health of the individual. There is no doubt in the world that the constant nursing of the sense of adversity <clears throat> in the life of the person will lead to physical deteriorations which will still further lo lower the and optimistic reflexes of the mind. The more sorry we are for ourselves, the more of ourselves we really have a right to be sorry for, because it keeps on building up until there seems to be no answer. Now, actually, uh, there is a certain sense of penetration that if we are thoughtful, we can change an attitude without necessarily changing the facts involved at all. 
I think Socrates is probably one of the great exponents of this concept when he showed his disciples a glass half full of water. Now he said that there are two kinds of people in the world who will look at this glass half filled with water. One will say the glass is half full. The other will say the glass is half empty. Now the pessimist is the one who says it's half empty. The optimist says it's half full. And in both cases, the actual amount of water remains the same. Therefore, there is some way in which uh, we can find things half full that we have long held to be half empty. In fact, this is the beginning of what might be termed a better way of life. Now, what will, do, what will we do to find this idea in ourselves? How can we develop the habit of realizing that things are really basically considerably better than we think and that we ourselves are destroying our own optimism. Well, one way, of course, is to stop listening to television reports and uh, cancel your newspapers and uh, um, just simply go take a vacation somewhere because everything today here is emphasizing the tragedy. We are doing nothing but recounting the, cur the cruelties and inhumanities of man to man. Well, a lot of it's true. And we know it's true. And we have to look at it and say to us, how, ourselves, how can we reconcile conditions as they are with a benevolent universal purpose? How can we say that we believe in God and then find that we believe in a God that can't do anything. That's probably the reason why he's always having so many people helping him, and as a result of the helping, things get worse and worse. <laughs> Actually, either the power is there, either this plan is purposed and working, or it isn't. Now, if we look carefully into the human pattern, we will realize that essentially humanity is sound. We are not a completely degenerate race of creatures getting ready to go back and swing in the jungle. We are really mostly well-intentioned people. We are intentionally in inclined to be kind, to be thoughtful, and to be generous. When an emergency strikes our community, we all get together and do what we can to help it. And then when it, the uh, emergency passes, we go on competing with each other for something. So there is a strong basic fabric here in this world of people who would like to do it right, who want to be good people, who want to be friendly, kindly, and generous, who want to support problems and principles which they feel are important. Time after time, vast charities are dedicated to purposes essentially intended to improve society. But these very often run afoul of exploitation and their virtues die. But there is a basic ground here of people who want to do it right. There are also a great many people who recognize right when they see it and are not deceived by wrong, but are not of themselves strong enough to face the situation. Exploitation is based largely upon catering to the cupidity of people. The individual who has many wants will be the victim of exploitation as long as he lives. The individual who has few wants, we like uh, the story that is tell, told about a, a salesman, and this is a true story by the way, who tried to sell ice boxes to the mountain people of Peru. Uh, way up there in the Andes. And uh, they were interested. They looked at them and shook their heads. And he told them they could get them for a dollar down and all the uh, offerings, that they could pay a little bit and have the machine insured for profit by the year and all that. And they told these natives what the price was. And they said, we don't have the money. Well, said the man, we can arrange credit for you. <laughs> you know. So uh, finally, he was absolutely unable to do anything with these people. 
So he sent a telegram uh, back to the head office, which read like this. He said, cannot sell ice boxes here. People suffer from damned wantlessness. <laughs> well, that's an ailment you don't hear much about these days. Everybody wants everything. But these people, these natives, who hadn't passed into the aura of higher civilization, just would not go into debt. The Greeks found that out. Lycurgus found that out long before the Christian era. The Hindus have found it. The Chinese know it. The Greeks and the Egyptians knew it. Everybody has known it. But they haven't the courage. They cannot get away from the glamour of fulfilling their wants. So one thing the individual can do to lower his anxieties is to divide sharply between his wants and his needs and allow a little extra for his wants, but not too much. If we were not extravagant, dishonesty throughout the business world would drop very rapidly. It is the cupidity of the individual that supports the uh, unfairness of uh, the moving institutions of our day. So one thing we can do is to lower the tension that comes from being unable to afford that swimming pool right now, or to get along a little longer without the 100-inch television screen. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, many people are wondering if the programs will just look larger and worse if they get the 100-inch skin. It will have nothing to do with the merit of the picture, and that is uh, applicable to many fields. Getting it more and bigger doesn't make it any better. And this situation has existed for the last 50 years, the desperate consequences. Always there's been worries, but many of them were something that grandfather himself could solve. Now governments can't solve them because of the selfishness of people. So to get over anxiety, make a careful list of the things that are causing anxiety. Whether it is unhappiness, self-pity, self-pity because you don't have as large a house as your neighbor, or do not drive an expensive car, or haven't yet been quite able to get that $40,000 camper, see whether or not you need it. Find out what you are doing to get yourself into this kind of problem. And realize that sometimes this extravagance is simply an effort to run away from yourself. You can't live with yourself any longer, so you start on a larger journey. But nothing happens. Get down and think through the actual problems of your life. If you solve the economic aspects with some efficiency, it will largely reduce the rest, because it is mostly to have to get that is giving us the trouble. So we'll think it through and see what your attitudes can be on the uh, values of things, the real values. Now another point that will help to understand the problem of adversity is to sit down very quietly and say what you really want to do with your life. Have you any worthwhile aspirations? Would you like to be better in any way that you are now? And always putting a censorship on the fact that the motive must not be economic. The motive must be personal. If you have some ability, some gift, some uh, consecration, some skill or some knowledge that you feel is important, then the problem is to begin to lean more heavily upon the development of these internal resources and less heavily upon pleasure, which is the, supposedly the base of happiness. The individual is more happy fulfilling himself than he can ever be by what he can accumulate. And now, with the present pattern of things, accumulation is a misery on the spirit. We do not know from moment to moment whether we have anything or nothing. But whatever we develop in personal resources, we will have. 
One of the problems of this also is the fact that so many human beings today cannot get along with themselves. The moment they're alone, they're miserable. They have to have some kind of a way of getting themselves off of their own minds. The moment they sit down, they're either lonely or neglected or irritated or disconsolate. Always they must be busy. Busy doing what? For the large measure, things that are not of any importance, whatever. But they just get our minds off our troubles, as one person told me. Well, it isn't so much getting the mind off of troubles that's going to solve the problem. It's getting the mind working on the problems and on the troubles to see what can be done about them. So if we begin to realize uh, the nature of the kind of world we live in, if we can gain a number of very interesting inducements. One of the interesting points is that we are all of us working desperately to accumulate something which can, we cannot have proprietorship over for more than a few years. The individual who has done everything possible to be comfortable in this world and in doing so has neglected every other consideration will in a short time just simply fade away from this world, leaving his wealth for his relatives to sue each other for, and he himself goes out into a dismal uncertainty for which he is in no way prepared. I have had many uh, deathbed scenes, and uh, for the most part, those who die with greatest comfort and pleasure and sincere integrity uh, are the ones who haven't too much. The more they have, the more they worry, and the more they worry, the more they try to bury their fears and anxieties, although perfectly aware that they are simply contributing to the uh, delinquencies of their descendants. There's no other attitude to it. So the person who is desperately trying for that extra ten million should wonder whether or not it is worth what it is doing to him. If he has what he needs, if he can cultivate simple pleasures and has certain mental activities and is improving himself through the arts, through literature, through study, or through various trades and techniques, uh, this individual is mostly the happy one. I had a friend years ago who went to retirement at 65 and it was a marvelous experience. Instead of settling back to try to live on their investments or something of that nature, they simply got into a new activity. For all their lives, this person had wanted to become an herbalist. They wanted to study the healing powers of herbs. After retirement, they lived 20 years working with their in involvements and studies with herbalism and left behind documents of great value to the science of medicine. Now, these pe this person was not much interested in wealth. They could have sold these things, but they had enough to live on, so all that they learned was given without charge or cost to scientific institutions. This was a little better effort to do something, but this person lived alone. But I knew them very well, and they said, thank God to be able to live alone. If I hadn't had the quietude of being alone, I could never have done this work. The next individual says, I'm dying because I'm lonely. It's all in what you do with it. And uh, every individual who realizes that he cannot change the course of history can change the quality of his own life, not only for the betterment of himself, for this would be a very selfish action, but anything that is worth doing must be useful to others, must be helpful, must be informative, must contribute in some way to the betterment of society. Maybe only a small gift, maybe a few hours a week given to some charitable purpose. But individuals who want to get over their anxieties must get something on their minds more important than their anxieties. They must be so busy learning how to live and share living with others that they have forgotten or completely transmuted most of these negative attitudes. 
the spiritual alchemy of medieval Europe, before chemistry was really known, was largely devoted to the transformation and transmutation of human character. To transform base metals into gold consisted largely of transmuting base attitudes into spiritual virtues. And these people accomplished a great deal by the realization that each one in his own life can be an alchemist, can transmute his own desires, not kill them, but transmute them, take all the base substances of his knowledge, take all the experiences of his life, and transform them into phases of personal unfoldment and common service. These things working together will do a lot to help uh, the anxieties of life. Anxieties also sometimes arise uh, in older years than the mistakes of younger years. People have temperaments of their own. No individual will reach 45 without knowing something about himself. He can't help it. He, uh, he has had to live with himself and he probably isn't enjoying it too much and that should tell him something. But the individual reaching say 40 or 45 years of age, should begin to recognize the things that he does that just do not work well. He may be a moderate drinker up to say 45, and then his physician or his common sense tells him he better let up. He might be a good old-fashioned um, smoker, but after he reaches a certain age, he may find that the remarks by the uh, medical board here that uh, tobacco or cigarettes are dangerous to health is, are true. Therefore, he quits of his own accord. And millions are quitting. Others have found out, for example, that spoiling children is a desperate mistake. And all these things come together and around middle life, from 40 or 45, the person should know much about his own weaknesses, about his own selfishness. He should know how often he has been injured by his own disposition. If he is a tempestuous character, if he is cruel, stubborn, bigoted, these things should begin to manifest themselves as problems. Now, of course, these people die hard in their own convictions, and the individual with a bad disposition always knows that it's the other person's fault. But by the time he's middle life and finds that the other persons have been leaving him by the dozen because of his dispositions, then he might pause and think a little bit about it. He can correct some of the more obvious causes of his own anxieties. He can decide a little bit about how important the various processes are, which he considers to be indispensable. Whether he really is going to gain enough to justify hazarding his health in order to get a larger position in the company. He can begin to wonder whether or not the position in the company is worth anything at all anyway, because the moment he gets there, a half a dozen ambitious people will try to get rid of him. So he goes into conflict with the world when he wants what everyone else wants. But when he wants only that which the wise want, there is no competition. He doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Because wisdom is a product that is absolutely indispensable and absolutely available. No individual has ever been able to control it. No one will ever buy or sell it. No one will ever put it up in pills. Wisdom is a universal inner quality of consciousness. And the individual can have more without anyone else having less. And if he is wise, he can have more and help others who have less to gain more for themselves. There is no shortage, no competition, and no one can corner the market. It is something that we all have available to us if we want it. Of course, when we start looking for it and saying, yes, I think that availability is good, we begin looking around, we don't see so much inside of ourselves as we thought we had. Most people think they're wise until they study the consequences of their own actions, and then they're not quite so sure. But if we're not as wise as we think we could be, or would be, or should be, there's always this possibility of improving from that moment on. We can do the things that help us to have a better and fuller life. 
As we do this, we will draw around us the kind of people who appreciate these things. We will no longer be the victim of those who dislike pro progress. We will find a new world where the old world was, and we do not have to walk one step in order to cross that bridge of qualifications. So we do, do, do what we can uh, to improve the inner life. Now one example, as I'm thinking of at the moment, has to do with a family that was very religious. They never missed a day at church, and they never missed an opportunity to put a knife in each other's back. <laughs> they were just overflowing with theology, and they could quote it, and they certainly appreciated it in other people. And they also wanted other people to appreciate it in them, but this was a little difficult. Actually, many people believe that religion is an attitude that it is something you join, that you about become a part of it by a cup full of water on the occiput. It is not the answer. No one is religious because he joins a religion. Some of the most religious people in the world have never joined anything. Maybe that's why they're religious. <laughs> but the really religious person is the one who has interpreted faith into deeds, actions, conditions. An individual who has made the changes in himself which transform us into enlightened religious people. I know this particular family went to church regularly. It took them a long time to get one man baptized because they were reluctant. But at the final end, they all joined the church. But nothing happened. The home was no better. There was a lot of talk. Uh, they decided they would say grace at meals. But the grace at meals did not cover the disgrace the rest of the time. <laughs> Nothing really happened. Except that they were acknowledged to be members of a cult or creed. Now this is another problem with all religion. Many people who really believe that they are enlightened that they have mystical overtones, psychic experiences, and have the very most advanced teachings on esoteric and mystical matters. And still, they're the same people. So whatever we're looking for, we must recognize that religion is important, very important. But it is the religion that is lived and not the religion that is accepted or acknowledged. It is a religion that goes inside and gives us the courage to do better, to forgive our enemies, to continue to live in a world of uncertainties made certain and strong by our faith in rules and principles stronger than this world. Without this type of believing, we are not going to get over our anxieties. We are not going to get over them on the grounds of joining a faith places an infallible redemption upon us. We are not actually Christians because we are baptized, but because we follow the, every day the teachings of Christ. And this is very difficult. I know many people who have never recognized the difference, who have never realized that uh, religion was a responsibility. They settle back convinced that they are saved. And, of course, to assure their salvation, the evangelist used to, ha used to have a circuit. And once a year, he came back and went over the circuit again, because the, uh, the redemption had lasted about one year. And if he didn't come back and give it to them afresh, uh, they couldn't hold out. This type of thing is no longer to be considered. Actually, therefore, uh, we must get out of adversities by facing a certain thing. Uh, one of the things we have to face today is the common feeling that many people have that the world is going to the dogs. We have to, on the one hand, believe that there is a wisdom that guides all things and a love that is inevitable and that the power that fashioned us has a purpose and that that purpose will be fulfilled. We have to put an actual trust 
in the integrities of life because otherwise all efforts to resist propaganda will fail. We cannot, on the other hand, go around every day complaining about the misfortunes and unfairness of everything if we still believe that there are rules. If it is true that there is a power in this universe that can see each sparrow's fall, we either believe it or we don't. If we do believe it, we cannot continue to nurse anxieties. Instead of nursing anxieties, the thing to do is to try to support in every way that we can the known rules and laws of that power which is the source of all life. If that power tells us that we should be unselfish, we should be. If that power says we should do unto others as we would have others do unto them, they, it means it. And our miseries are the result of not doing that. At this particular time, tests have shown and research has shown that the golden rule is an essential tenet in, the, in practically every religion of the world. It is just as present in Taoism, in China, in Confucianism, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Muslimism, and all of the cults and creeds of Africa and the primitive American relig uh, reg regions, the Amerindian people. Everywhere where there is essential native integrity, the golden rule is the foundation of civilization. The moment we talk ourselves out of that, or try to live without considering it, the problems multiply. Now one will say, well, I know I should do it, but uh, I really can't afford it. Uh, I can't go against the pressures of my time. I can't resist all of the needs of life. I can't give up my job because I don't like it. So we have to make some understanding. This understanding comes definitely with the realization that the job, the problem, and every other thing else that can annoy us is all part of the plan of our own growing. We are responsible to adjust to that which we cannot change, but adjust without compromise of principles. If we can do this, uh, our anxieties will rapidly uh, dissipate. We will not have nearly as many of them. Also, as our anxieties are overcome by our integrities, we will find that we can get away from a large part of the medicinal problem that is destroying thousands of lives. People who cannot stand the daily work take the pills. They cannot dare stare or stay awake at night, they cannot get up feeling like anything, uh, they are on every kind of a diet you can think of, most of which is cosmetic and has very little relationship to the needs of the individual. So in an effort to keep up our energies, we take on a series of medications that will ultimately probably destroy us. Because we have the courage, we have the integrities to straighten out our own lives. Many neurotics become psychopath psychopathic and have to be institutionalized. And the neurosis is simply due to a series of frustrations that have eaten their way into the life and consciousness of the person until he can no longer endure them. Nearly all neurotics have a foundation in a false believing or a false dedication of some kind. This is one of the problems that we have with various metaphysical and mystical situations where fear of evil magic and all this type of thing eats into the individual and destroys peace of mind. But with integrity, actual and real, you do not have to have any of these fears. Most of the people who are looking for spiritual growth essentially want to use it to advance their physical ambitions. In other words, they want to move in a better society. They want to be able to over-influence other people. They want to be able to get what they want physically. And they are using a divine power to gratify their physical appetites. This is not good. This in itself will cause all kinds of troubles and will gradually end in a, a psychoneurosis. Egotism will do the same thing. 
the belief of the individual that he is of the noblest kind if not supported by an internal undeniable nobility of character that means nothing except further trouble because this ambitious nobility complex will cause him to struggle and perhaps be even viciously dishonest in order to improve his fortunes. So everywhere it goes back to ourselves in substance and essence. We must recognize that uh, the frustrations of the time, that the anxieties of the time are here because they are the natural results of causes. And that as we continue to these causes, we will pass them on to generations as yet unborn. I do not believe with some uh, dismal souls that we are all going to disappear in an atomic or nuclear holocaust. I don't think that would not be the real end of things. We, that wouldn't cause the kind of suffering we have to have. That To wipe the whole thing out would be the easy way for a great many people. But I think we'd better begin to think seriously of the fact we're not going to be wiped out. Whatever happens, the individual, either in this world or somewhere else, is going to have to live with himself and can it, until he can live with himself happily. Then he doesn't need to anymore. But happiness in this case is to live with yourself realizing that you have fulfill the divine plan in your own life. That you have done the things that would have been the greatest good to the greatest number. That you have un been unselfish, that you have been moderate in your appetites, that you have been a person of integrity and inner moral courage. These things have to come. And no matter of how much nuclear holocaust we have, here, somewhere, or in eternity, we, each of us must create our own integrity. And when we find that, we do that, we know that, we become well-adjusted and useful citizens. Vanity is not usefulness. The constant effort to influence other people, to advance our fortunes, and to repolish the surface of our dispositions, all this is useless unless this disposition bears witness to an internal maturity. Now man has everything necessary in himself to be what he wills to or wants to be. And when he wants to be what he needs to be, we have the answer. And each of us in his own way, in their own time, can go to work on the little things that will help to advance this cause. We are not expected to be perfect in the short run. It can't be done. But we can every day get a realization that we've made a step forward. And as our steps forward add up, our anxieties slowly fade away. We are in a universe that is with beyond question the most extraordinary instrument that is conceivable or even inconceivable by man. This universe shows a power of some kind that transcends all conceivable skills. It represents somewhere at the source of things a vast rationality that is tempered with infinite mercy because its final end is perfection of things, not their destruction. But this universe, which is so much larger than any scientist can even imagine, and the rules of which are so intricate that the human mind as we know it cannot hope to encompass them. In this vast structure of things, we have a dream of security. We have a sense that this tremendous, incredible pattern is meaningful. It is there for a purpose. This vast galaxy of stars that we can see in the midnight sky is not just composed of little candles to light our way home in the night. It is a tremendous unit, a tremendous mechanism. It is so vast that it is inconceivable. But on a smaller scale, is man his own body. His own composite constitution is a miracle just as great. The intricacy, the wonder, the magnificent combination of factors that make human life possible. 
Where it comes from we do not know, and what we do not know we cannot afford to waste. What we do not know how to use, we must learn how to use. And we learn, as Lord Bacon pointed out, through observation and experience. Every minute that something happens to us, we are exposed to a rule of some kind that we are either keeping and doing better or breaking and doing worse. This tremendous pattern should give the individual a realization that he is never alone, that nothing that he tries to do is ever forgotten that no growth he ever makes will ever fail him, and that somewhere in this vast pattern of things all good is rewarded, and actually in the end all is good. Thus we have something on which to build a certain kind of faith, so that in the moments when anxiety gets a, a tendency to take over, we can begin to understand something of our own destiny. Now this is one of the reasons I feel that a broad foundation of knowledge is very important. Not necessarily an effort to solve the unsolvable, but everywhere around us there are evidences in history, in art, in literature, in science, in philosophy, in religion, of the tremendous diversity of human achievement and the many expressions of human growth. And uh, each person who performs a constructive action adds something to the good of mankind. And the more we know about life, the more we know about people, the fewer strangers there will be in our hearts and minds. While we close ourselves to everything except the small purposes of our daily life, we have very little resource with which to resist anxiety. But as we become aware of the wonderful achievements of the human mind, the wonderful compassions of the human heart, the wonderful deeds which have become part of the history of humanity. When these things become apparent to us, we can begin to realize that we live in a world of achievements, that we live in a world of fulfillments, and are faced by a great many things that need fulfillment at the moment, instead of thinking of nothing to do but to drift along till we die. Let us realize that this is an era and a world of infinite challenge to new achievements, to reforms, to revivals, to deepening character, to strengthening human relationships, to moderating human appetites, to reduce human selfishness and crime, reduce poverty. These are all things that need doing. And in this world, the most important part of our life is to face the things that need doing. We want to know more about how things could be, how they have worked better, and how perhaps in our personal lives we can help them to work better every day. If we become better acquainted uh, with, for instance, comparative religion, we won't be plagued by heathens anymore. And we won't be dominated by atheists or unbelievers. If we develop a better understanding of philosophy, we will know how man has solved problems and continue to do so. That philosophy brings down to us the wisdom of the past and that this philosophy is essentially constructive. If it is a materialistic, uh, non-ethical philosophy, we will then realize its uselessness. If we go into the arts, music, painting, poetry, drama, all these are opportunities for the human being to grow, to find new ways of expanding his own inner resources. The person who is growing all the time doesn't have as many anxieties as the person who is waiting impatiently for something to happen. So everything we do that is possessive and progressive is good. It helps us to gain certain insights, certain values that will help us to live in the future. So let's get out of the idea that everything is going to, the, uh, to infinite misery and come to the realization that everything is going to its own infinite fulfillment. 
You can look back over history and see what happens to those who break the rules. And this is one of the reasons why history is important. Some say, well, history is just a bunch of records of failures and excesses and wars and crimes. It's more than that. Under the, on the surface of this earth are the ruins of probably 10,000 years of history. Ruins that are all due to the same thing. And incidentally, that same thing is what we are doing today. We haven't learned enough. We have been so busy thinking we were different that we have forgotten to realize that in many ways we will always be the same. This, this history tells us what happens uh, when the wrong people run the world, when the individual is subdued by his appetites rather than held up by his convictions. So we have here a, a history that also shows what happens when these things get so bad. About at a certain type, the universal reformation always occurs. At a certain time when me people make so many mistakes that they cannot live with them, there is a major change in human policy. And that major change arises within the humanity itself. This change is not brought about by a few leaders, good or bad. Uh, this change is brought out by the fact that humanity itself has locked within it the solution of its own problems. The humanity in man rises up against the inhumanity in man and there is a major change in policy. Then things go better for a little while, but then the eternal selfishness sneaks in again. The individual who gets rid of the desp uh, one despotism falls victim to another. Inside ourselves, however, we do not have to fall victim. We can continue to grow. We can learn what was taught in old times. We can learn the integrities of life. We can learn the values and come to understand the contributions that the good, the good and the enlightened have always made. But the uh, real joy and wonder of it all lies in the fact that within each of us is the potential of the fulfillment of our purpose. Not necessarily our ambition, but the reason for ourselves. And this reason must ultimately become our aspiration, whereas worldly things are already failing as the sources of ambition. Actually, man cannot fail. He can go down into troubles. He can destroy his own values for a certain length of time. But in the end, humanity will achieve the ultimate victory of reality over illusion, truth over error. It is inevitable, and it is all working in that direction. The thing we don't like is the fact that nature has had to become a little more strict in the administration of its justice. Nature cannot afford to cuddle delinquency. If it does, then the cataclysm could really occur. So nature has to bring us back to values, to the realities, to the truths of things. And when we accept these, we will find that nature is a wonderful, loving parent and not a cruel des despot of any kind. So I think if we can gradually realize that you can't believe in God, and at the same time believing that everything is going to the dogs. You must make your choice. The choice of, of atheism or that type of thinking is that it does no good. It doesn't help you. It doesn't make anything any better. And it gradually corrodes away the virtues that remain. But if we take an optimistic attitude in ourselves, not a Pollyannaish mystic attitude, but a constructive dedication to rolling up our sleeves and doing what needs to be done, I don't think there's very much anyone has to actually fear. The only thing that we fear is the misunderstanding we have of the processes of life. We fear life because we do not understand life. We fear death because we do not understand death. 
but we are moving inevitably to that which is beyond fear the immortality of truth the immortality of human relationships in dignity the immortality of love and faith and cooperation for the fulfillment of the plan which is intended and the purpose of this plan is to unfold and enrich everything that lives even the little bugs and bees are growing everything is moving forward because for the most part these creatures have not yet had individualized uh, attitudes the little creatures of the world birds and the bees and the fish follow immutable law without personal resistance they have no individuality to stand as we do and pass judgment on each other as a result of this and left to their own contrivances these creatures in a balanced world will not accept, exceed their populations they will not in any way danger the balance of nature but man is no longer moved by an inevitable pressure he is no longer a creature of brood instincts he is no longer guided or guarded by a natural law and science now proves incidentally that this natural law is largely contributed to each of these species by the mother the little bird the little animal follows the example of the mother and from the mother learns when to run and when to stop when to stick stick its head up and when to lower it closely and at what time it should hide itself in the nearest bush these things it learns from the traditional attitudes of the parent this factor is still somewhat necessary but is being neglected in the human world it is still very important that the young shall learn by the example of the parents but it is also true that man has something else which should make him very much more important and more honorable than simply an animal man has the right to be right and of all things which arise from the tempt the temptations and confusions of living the individual has the power to make his own personal decisions of integrity as far as we know in this world he is the so only creature so endowed he is the only creature that in a natural world can break the laws of nature because if this were not true man could never attain virtue he could never become good if good was a universal fact that was irresistible he can become good because he can choose he has the right to be right and to know it and to live it and to work with it every day of his life and as much as he can do of this will help him and as he gra gradually gains the skill to rule his own life he will find his anxieties fade away because anxiety is actually a subconscious worry or fear that the mistake that we made will come back to us we may not rationalize it to that degree but as long as we do not do things well anxieties will remain but when we do things well anxieties are transmuted into faith in the integrities of existence and there cannot be faith and fear in one nature fear gives us anxiety faith gives us courage and the more in even small daily deeds that we can do that will give us courage the less we have to worry about and the fewer our fears will be Oh, I think that's all for this morning, folks.